Have you been getting inconsistent results from conversion optimization or A-B testing, or maybe no results at all? It's probably because you're doing it wrong. Maybe you're copying random tactics from a blog post. Maybe you're copying competitors or market leaders, or maybe just following best practices. That's not how you optimize a website. There is a process, a framework for conversion optimization that is industry agnostic. So it works for SaaS, for e-commerce, B2B, media, you name it. It works across the board and gets you insane results. And I'm gonna teach it to you. Conversion rate optimization is a way to make more money, but how do you do it? What is conversion optimization, or as it's usually referred to, conversion rate optimization, CRO? Conversion rate is a mathematical formula. So if you have 50 people buy your stuff or sign up to your email, but 1,000 people came to your website or a landing page or whatever it is, you just divide the two and you get, oh, I have a 5% conversion rate. And then of course, in order for us to make more money, we need a higher conversion rate. They say that conversion rate optimization is all about increasing the conversion rate so it will be 6% or 7%. But I kind of disagree or rather I don't like that terminology. Actually, I don't like the R in conversion rate optimization because it's not about the conversion rate. Let's say you build a brand new website. You just tell your mom about it. So, and she goes to your website. One person and she buys something. So one visit, one purchase, 100% conversion rate. Amazing, right? Yet you just sold something to your mom and that's it. That's not a business. So conversion rate optimization is not about the conversion rate. Another way that you can incre increase conversion rate if you want to like, Make every product you sell free or one cent. So let's say you build a new Amazon, sell everything that Amazon sells, but everything is free. Your conversion rate will be insane. Everybody will purchase something for free, but you'll go out of business. So optimizing just for conversion rate is silly. Don't do that. So conversion optimization really is about growth. It's about growth. What is it that we need to do to our website so we could grow our business sustainably and profitably. Now, there are multiple ways to do this. And traditional way is we all have opinions. Hmm, I think we should do this. We should make this button bigger. We should add more image sliders. No, no, no. Everybody has an opinion what should be done. And opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one and they all stink. So opinions is not a way to optimize anything. You know, I've been doing this conversion rate optimization for years, 10 years. Now, if I have to predict which change will result in more money, I get it right maybe around 60, 65%. That's just slightly better than flipping a coin. So basically random. You can't have an opinion about these things. Uh, well, you can have an opinion, but the odds that you're gonna actually guess something right Ah, oh, the odds are very low. It's like playing a lottery. So that's not how conversion optimization works. So the main question is, what should we change? You know, because in optimization, we want to change something about the website, add something, remove something, modify something. So we would make more money. So more people would buy our stuff or, you know, become a lead or whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. So what do we do? Now, if we agree that opinions are the wrong way to go about it, and the right way is conducting research. We need to figure out what are the current problems with our website. Where are the problems and why these problems are problems to begin with. Only if we understand where, what and why these problems exist, we can come up with a better idea, an idea how to fix them. We call these treatments. We apply a treatment. Maybe we do an A-B test, maybe we just change uh, something on the website. So imagine you're going to the doctor's office and Let's say you have abdominal pain Arr! and your doctor says, oh, very well, please lie down here. We'll get the nurses. We'll just cut you right open and, you know, like perform a surgery. And you're like, whoa, dude, I just got here. And like that, that's opinion. Like I have an opinion. It's your, you know, whatever, your liver when we need to perform a surgery right here. Whereas you would expect that they'll run a bunch of tests, the blood test and, you know, CT scan and, you know, all that stuff, like they need to conduct 
research to figure out what's wrong with you and then uh, prescribe uh, a method of treatment, right? So this very same thing on the website, yet we jump to having just opinions and we want to change stuff on our website just by looking at it. It doesn't work like that. So we need to conduct conversion research and in the following videos, we're going to dive right into how to do this. And so many people also ask me, so what are the, like the super killer ninja secrets about, you know, conversion rate optimization? What are the magical things that always work? Maybe some psychological trickery? Well, no, there is, n there are no secrets. There's no magic in here. It's, it's purely uh, hard, hard work. So as I see conversion optimization consists of two parts. It's doing research to understand the problems, uh, to understand the problems. And then from the problems, we come up with hypothesis, uh, uh, hypothesis about what should be changed to address this problem, to fix the problem. And then we don't know what will work. We'll come up with four, five, 75 ideas for treatments. And then we'll need to run experiments to see which of these treatment ideas actually works and which one works the best. So it's research plus experimentation. So stop thinking about guesses, think about data-backed hypotheses, and that's how you optimize websites. Let's say that tomorrow you are hired as a conversion optimization manager for a big company, and they give you the goal of incre increasing their conversion rate 20% per year. How would you do it? So if your answer about improving the conversion rate of a website is instantly tactic coming, oh, make the headline bigger, put the button here, da 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 da, da you're doing it wrong. It's immediately how you can recognize somebody who's an amateur versus somebody who's a pro because pros focus on the process. As uh, one of the management gurus, Deming, uh, said 60, 70 years ago, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. The same applies to conversion optimization. So the process for any website is the same. If you're trying to optimize an e-commerce site, a lead, lead gen site, media site, a SaaS, doesn't matter. The process is always the same. The tactics might be different, and they often are, but the process is the same. So largely speaking, conversion rate optimization process always starts with conversion research. You figure out what the problems are, where, why these problems are problems. You then, once you have a list of problems, you turn these into hypotheses. So hypothesis is if we change, based on the data X, Y, Z, if we now change this and that, we expect to change this metric. You know, more people will do that, more people will do, uh, do this other thing. So you have a list of hypotheses. You turn these into tests, into experiments. You run A-B tests, um, and uh, once the tests are done, you analyze the results, and maybe you implement, maybe you discard, maybe, you, and then you go back to step one, which is conversion research. It always starts with research. But how do you conduct research? There are multiple ways to go about it. There's no one right way to do this. Um, I would recommend you start your conversion uh, research process by adopting Research Excel framework. Research Excel is a framework that I came up with around 2013, and we have used it on hundreds and hundreds of websites uh, over, the, over the many years since, and it works really, really well. So Research Excel, essentially what it does is it uses six types of data. So it gathers data input from six various different sources, uh, with the goal to analyze what are the problems, where and why. One of the, the first step in this process is always technical analysis. Now, technical analysis means that we want to figure out whether the website in question works with every single device, every single browser, and a combination of the two. So if I'm on a random Huawei phone, on a random whatever browser, the website should still work because you can have the most persuasive website in the world but if it doesn't work with the specific browser device combination i am on it doesn't matter right so it needs to work recently at the cxl live conference there was this big case study where dell launched a brand new website 
a brand new website that they had been working on for a really, really long time. A lot of money was invested in it and they rolled it out to a small percentage uh, of the traffic first to be sure that it's better and measured it and revenue per visitor dropped and they're like, what? How is this possible? And then they looked at the, their website, they talk, talked about it. Oh, like we need to make some UI enhancements here. We need to, you know, polish the design here and make this process a little smoother. So they implemented 20 plus changes and ran a new test. The result, the revenue per user now dropped 45%. And they're like, what the hell is the problem? And only later they found out that all of this was because of technical bugs. There were a bunch of JavaScript errors in their checkout, things didn't work. Websites not working is the biggest conversion killer there is and is also the lowest hanging fruit. If, if currently you have some browser segments or devices that are underperforming, fixing those bugs is the easiest, the fastest way to more money. So here's what you should do. In your digital analytics platform, let's say Google Analytics, you pull out the browser report and you want to compare the conversion rate per browser version uh, within the same browser family. So for instance, if your website converts at 5% for Internet Explorer 11, but only 2% for Internet Explorer 10, that's like more than two times difference. Why? It's because of some nasty bugs or some whatever weird UX stuff. So now you need to go uh, investigate it, figure out what is the problem. Um, if, you, if you don't want to do it yourself, there are... Um, you know, QA people uh, out there, quality insurance people or companies you can hire that will go in and do this technical testing for you. But basically you want to understand which browser versions convert less than some other versions. And same for devices. Uh, of course, mobile typically tends to convert uh, much less than desktop, but this is really dependent on what you're selling. In B2B for expensive products, like, you know, we're talking like, 10,000 a year or, or more, uh, or any, anything around th thousands of dollars. Mobile does not, mobile traffic doesn't really convert. People are still not, you know, used to spending a lot of money mobile. Yet when it's like trinkets, small stuff, uh, the conversion rate is very high. Uh, it, especially if people are transactional, they already know what they want. They'll go to a website and buy on a mobile phone, no problem. So, but on average, we see that mobile converts around 25% of what desktop does, and that's just a broad average, means nothing for your particular website. And But tablets typically convert the same as desktop, because if you think about it, tablets are not mobile devices, because 90% of tablets sold are Wi-Fi only, so you can't use it on a bus only at home, and you're probably sitting on a couch at home while using your tablet, right? So it's kind of like desktop and it's big screen. So if you see your tablet converting less in a desktop version, the tablet experience is probably suffering. There's something going on and maybe bugs. And of course, you want to actually eat your own dog food and you know, open up your website on your own mobile phone or, or desktop, you know, both, and just walk through your website like a regular human being and check out and complete a purchase or whatever the thing is that you want people to do there. So technical analysis, figure out underperforming browser segments, device segments. Another thing about technical analysis is site speed. If pages are too slow, the people, uh, you know, might leave and not buy as much. So again, uh, in Google Analytics, you can look at your page speed per URL. So, you know, there are all these various page speed tools out there and they're great. You should use them. There's one by Google called uh, Page Speed Insights. There's GT Metrics, various different kinds. So if you Google, you know, site speed analysis tools, you'll, you'll find a ton. But bear in mind that if you just put in your home page, they will only analyze your home page, not your entire site. Your website has probably lots of pages. If you're on an e-commerce site, you probably have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of product pages, right? So you want to, uh, you want to analyze your top 50, top 100 websites with the most traffic and see what the average, um, interaction time is. And notice I didn't say page load time. So what is page load time? Page load time is really how long does it take for the page to be completely loaded? So if it's a long page, meaning the uh, most of it is below the fold, we as users, if we're still looking at the above the fold area, we don't really care how long it takes to load the rest of the page there 
even if it takes you know another 15 seconds we just don't notice it what actually the users care about is document interactive time which actually means how long until the website becomes usable so basically the above the fold area renders and we can click uh, click around and you know interact with the website that's what really users care about so ideally it's three seconds or less and if you have high volume websites you know those those small differences might start mattering if it's between say four to ten seconds uh you know it's it's kind of the average but you should get closer to three uh seconds or less and but if it's, if some pages are 10 seconds or more you can be sure that this is hurting your conversion rate on those pages so typical culprits are too large images you know like your image is like seven megabytes and people are on a non wi-fi network it takes a while to load or you you have a you know too many different css and javascript files uh, so there's a lot of uh, back and forth between the browser and the server and that all slows your site down it's very front end development heavy uh, and if you're not a front end developer you probably are not able to fix those issues yourself but you can figure out which pages are too slow and send that to your front end developer and say hey there's a problem here with the site speed with the page load speed fix it so that's technical analysis this is always the very first step in conversion optimization once you've done that and you fixed all the bugs and you know you have no more slow loading pages it's time to move on to step number two which is heuristic analysis step number two in our conversion research process is heuristic evaluation heuristic analysis Essentially what it means is it's an experience-based assessment of our website. So we're going to conduct a walkthrough of our website page by page. We're going to walk through the site like an average user, desktop and mobile separately because, you know, it's a different experience, different things matter uh, and so on. And this exercise is best done in, in a group setting. People from a team, people who have never used your website, actual target uh, audience members, you know, up to six people and you're gonna go page by page and you show it on, on a big screen or you know laptop if you don't have a big screen <clears throat> and and basically we're gonna assess every single page against the set of criteria which I've written down here there are various heuristic analysis mm, frameworks out there um, and uh, you know some have seven steps and some have 17 steps and all that stuff essentially it all boils down to these four steps and you know you could have sub branches of of uh, of these four but essentially it's it's always about these four things so what do you do you, you're not going to comment on websites like oh i don't like the blue and oh i don't like the red you know that's just an opinion so we need to be more structured in our feedback in our observations so everything that we're going to comment about a web page so either it's a home page or a thank you page or card page whatever it is we're going to do it in a structured manner and we're going to try to categorize each piece of feedback uh, under one of these four so first thing friction friction is something that makes it difficult to use or it's it's difficult to understand so for instance if they want us to fill out a form with like 27 form fields that's a lot of work that's friction like ah, i don't want to do that or if the website is uh, has a kind of a scammy looking design from you know like 2002 uh, blinking banners and you know da, 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 it looks like sketchy that's friction it's like mental friction like ooh, i don't know about this stuff people need to feel comfortable at your site if you're amazon you don't have trust problems if if you're on you know relatively uh, unknown um, site then you, you're going to have big trust issues and so friction is a big Big issues so everything anything that causes mental friction uh or is difficult to do or i don't understand what i should do next or i'm trying to click this button and it doesn't work it's it, it all creates friction second thing is is distraction so every single page on your website should have one primary goal so you know typically the goal of your home page is to get people off the home page like down the funnel or it's the goal might be segmentation like choose here are you like male or female am i uh, 
small business or large business, things like that, or I'm interested in this service or the other service. So anything on that page that is not contributing to people taking that one action is a distraction. So if you want people to click a specific button or fill out a form or whatever it is, but there are all these other things there. There's like, oh, latest four, five blog posts, and there's like, would you also be interested in and 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 there might be, or worse yet, there's something moving. There's an animated banner. There's one of those sl automatic sliders. Every three seconds, something changes. Or, or the worst yet, a video background like or with music. Like, doo -doo -doo, psh, stuff starts moving around. So what happens is like our human brain is designed to detect and follow movement. You know, like ages ago, this was a useful survival skill. Like we needed to see if a, like a mammoth is coming to, you know, trample on us or a predator or an enemy and so on. But today on a website, so as soon as you have any, any something changing every three seconds, it's a distraction. We're going to just look at it and we're not going to read the value proposition. We're not going to understand what your website does and why we should buy from you. And we're not going to fill out this, this form. So anything that is not directly contributing to people taking the one action, is a distraction. On a product page in e-commerce, the goal is hit add to cart. So anything in there that is not contributing to that, it's better removed. Motivation is more important than distraction and friction. So motivation is about making people want to take action. So like we, we talked about friction. 27 form fields, fill out this form. <laughs> Never. Well, if you fill out this form, you're gonna get a free Tesla uh, P90D uh, Model S. <sighs> Only 27 form fields? I could do 127. So the amount of friction uh, is, is very relative compared to the amount of motivation. Now, of course, your product is not a free Tesla, right? It's something else. It's not as good as it costs money, probably. But still, you need to sell people on the value of your offer. If you're selling a vacation, you know, you want to make us want to go there you know the photography the product copy all of those things matter a lot so your first goal when you're trying to get people to take action whether it's to click somewhere add to cart fill out a form is to make them want to do it or not make them want to fill out the form but make them yearn for the final outcome that they're going to get you know if you're going to give us money uh, you're gonna get six-pack abs and all, all that good stuff like of course if you you know diet for two years and exercise and, and then finally relevancy so relevancy is that you can have an amazing value proposition and really short forms and like beautiful beautiful design and minimal distraction but if it's about fishing equipment I personally couldn't care less because I'm not a fisherman so the relevance is so important. So we need, you need to be absolutely clear who this is for. Who is this for? The higher the relevancy, the, the, the higher the odds that I'm going to convert. So you want to make sure that you address that, uh, the fact that if I am your ideal target audience member, target user, why should I buy from you right now? So build that path so people would read it and recognize, aha, this is for me. Uh, and if, you drive, if you're using ads to drive traffic to a page, of course, you want to make sure there's continuity from the ad copy as well as design if it's a visual ad uh, and the landing page copy and the visual the way it looks like. It, it needs to match. So if you have all these four things in place, uh, you know, you're good to go. So you go through your website step by step, every single page that matters. A mobile desktop separately and just write down your observations on every single page. The important thing to note is that these observations is not the absolute truth. So 50% of your observations are gonna probably going to be irrelevant. They actually don't matter. Uh, but what follows next in our conversion research process is we're gonna gather qualitative as well as quantitative data to, to either validate or invalidate uh, our observations. Digital analytics will show you what is happening, where, and how much.
Third step in our conversion research process is digital analytics. So for most people, it's Google Analytics, but you can use you know whatever other web analytics tool that you know is better best fit for you. Number one thing in analytics is always is everything being measured. So every single thing that a user can do on a website and every single thing that a user can experience on a website should be tracked and measured. So for instance, let's imagine that we have an e-commerce site. So what are all the things that people can do? They go to the home page, maybe there's a slider there, and they can manually click through different images. Every time they interact with the slider, we should mark it down, we should fire an event. That's what it's called in analytics. We fire an event when they're interacting with the slider. They're scrolling down. Oh, how, how far down? 25% of the page, 50% longer? We record that automatically. Uh, there's a YouTube video maybe about a product overview. Are they watching the video? And if they are watching the video, how long did they watch everything or just the first two seconds? We need to measure that. If they're searching for something, we should measure that. Uh, they go to the category page, there are all these filters. So, you know, uh, size, filter by size, price, color, blah, blah, blah. Uh, are they interacting with the filter? Which one? Um, if they click add to cart, we need to cl cl click that and obviously, all the purchasing data, the, the full funnel, they go to the cart page and all the multiple checkout steps, everything needs to be measured. Because if things are not being measured, we can't improve stuff. So let's say, let's say that you have a product filter for, uh, you know, filter products by color. Now, how many people are using it? And if they are using it, what is the impact on user behavior? Like, are they more likely to purchase, less likely to purchase? No difference. And if like 1% of the users are using that filter, and if they are using it, they convert worse, it's probably a good idea not to have it to begin with. But you wouldn't know that if you wouldn't track it. Also, if you want to optimize your product page so more people will click on add to cart, but you're not measuring specifically cart ads, you can't optimize for it because you don't know if the change you made increased cart ads or not. So it's very important that we measure everything. If you're using Google Analytics, then all this measurement you can set up with Google Tag Manager. And it's not difficult at all. It's, in fact, if you're a marketer, you need to be able to use Google Tag Manager on your own, and you can set up all this tracking without any developer, developer involvement. There are other tools that record more stuff out of the box, like Heap Analytics, uh, for instance, measures everything that, um, that needs to be measured right away automatically uh, but you know as soon as you go above 50,000 uh, page views a month you know, it becomes rather expensive now so first thing make sure everything is being measured everything that is important for you number two the data that we're measuring is it accurate it's so often that the data that you know, the funnels that have been configured and so on is actually not true sometimes you see websites where they have really low bounce rate uh, for instance, a bounce rate is like 1%, 2%, 3%. So people are like, oh, I'm the boss, look at my bounce rate. Whenever you see that, it's like, no, this is called broken measurement. So, you know, if you have uh, the GA code loaded twice on the page, your bounce rate will be off and, you know, below 10%. If you uh, have an event uh, that is firing and it's uh, not sent, uh, set to non-interactive, uh, you know, engagement is, is being recorded. Again, your bounce rate, rate is uh, artificially low. So those things can screw up your data. Also, you see all the time where people have a five-step checkout uh, funnel and it shows like 100% of people go through all the steps. No, this never happens in real world, so it's broken. Or the final purchasing count or the revenue does not match what we're seeing on the back end in our content management system or on our e-commerce um, uh, system. So you need to verify that all these things are active, that they make sense. When you look at the data, like is like on average, people add 77 products to the cart. Really? I don't think that's accurate, right? Whenever you see something that's fishy, it's like, it's probably not true. Also, you see often revenue being double counted. Uh, or if you know people for some reason can reload their uh, thank you page, which they shouldn't be able to do. Again, like the transaction is loaded multiple times, can inflate the revenue and all these metrics. And then there are all, also things like 
you're using subdomain, you know, let's say your blog is on a subdomain or, or you use um, uh, multiple domains, you know, like your uh, shop dot, your domain dot com and blog dot, and then you have your main domain. Uh, if people navigate between those subdomains, is subdomain tracking implemented? Or every time they switch between subdomains, maybe it shows up as a new visitor, even though it came from a paid Google ad. So that attribution gets lost if subdomain and cross-domain tracking are not uh, properly set up. So it's very, very important. If you cannot trust the data, you cannot be data-driven. So these are very, very important first steps. Now, assuming that everything is all right, we can trust the data, everything is recorded. Now, for conversion optimization purposes, digital analytics helps us identify three very important things. Number one is where are the leaks? Every single page on your website is leaking money, meaning users are dropping off, they're leaving your website. And you have you know, some sort of a typical customer journey, a funnel. And so you wanna understand in which of these funnel steps people are dropping off the most. So typically, let's say it's on e-commerce, cart page, 50% proceed to checkout. So if you're in your site, it's like 20% or 30%, you have a big, big problem with your cart page. Or on your product page, typically on an average site, it's like 10% uh, of people add something to the cart. If for you that's, you know, 1% or even less, something's wrong with your product page. Either you have the wrong people on the site, you know, in relevance issue. In your checkout, so what is the checkout completion rate? Should be like, around 90%, which would be good if only 20% of people finally put in the credit card and finalize the payment. Again, it's probably the checkout that, that has the problem. Of course, these are all hypotheses. We don't really know, but we, can, we don't really know what the problem is, but we can see where they're dropping off. Very important. And again, you have to look at this across devices separately. So mobile separately, uh, uh, desktop, and, and so on and so forth. We also want to see, look at correlation. So the people who are buying something, what other behaviors are correlating with high purchasing rate? Now, what, we, what you don't know is like, is it that people who were going to buy anyway use site search or did they just know what they want? Or was it that using the site search helped them find more relevant products which increased their likelihood, likelihood of making a purchase? So if that is the case, we should try to get more people to use the search or we will make more money, make the search box maybe more prominent, bigger, and so on and so forth. So we want to understand what are people doing or not doing and how does that correlate uh, with conversion rate or revenue per user. And of course, we want to always segment all the data per traffic source, per device, any segmentation that might make sense for you. If on your website people are logged in, you might also be able to segment per uh, you know, gender, or if it's B2B by, by revenue, business type, what they do, all those things. So very important. What's a quick and easy way to figure out what people are doing or not doing on your website? Heat maps. There's another category of analytics tool usually referred to as customer experience tools or, or mouse tracking tools. Essentially what they do is they give you a scroll map. So it's a basically a visual representation in a form of a heat map to show how far down people scroll on a given page. So typically what it, what it tends to look like is uh, you have a page like this and then at the top, uh, it's like all red, so there's a lot of people are using this uh, scrolling, 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 and then it gets yellower, 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 and then it's blue, like nobody's scrolling here. And, and what's interesting about scroll maps is like, where is this trans transition here? Where is the transition where the, the red becomes kind of blue? And this is important because the con sometimes important content is in this area, so most people don't see it. Or another way why this is important, we want to understand where is this moment where people are dropping off. It's usually something about the design of the page that makes people stop scrolling. It's typically a change in the background color. So maybe here was the background color was white and here it's suddenly blue or black or whatever. So dramatic background color change. So people assume that this is where the page ends or that the content below is not relevant to the content above. Uh, so once we see this, there's like, ah, look at this line here. 
Let's remove that. Let's make it have a uniform background color and scrolling uh, imp can improve. Or you see like nobody sees this important va important value proposition. Let's move this above the fold. So scroll maps, really great way to figure this kind of stuff out. Uh, click maps. Click maps basically show you again a heat map of where people clicking on your page. You can obviously see this data also in Google Analytics. But the nice thing about showing it in a heat map form is a you quickly see where people are clicking or not clicking. Uh, as, and executives love this kind of report, so it's very easy for everybody to see and click. And sometimes something that you really want people to interact with does not get any love at all from users. Maybe it's not prominent enough, maybe other things are more prominent. Um, and also you can see things that people are trying to click on that is actually not a link. So maybe you have something that looks like a button. Maybe you have an image and people assume that they should be able to click on that image and go somewhere, that it should be a link, but it's not. So they're like clicking, sometimes they're rage clicking like, and nothing happens. So then it's like, oh, going to make that into a link. Then there are hover maps where like basically show where the mouse cursor has been moving. Some call it attention maps and that's completely useless. It's a kind of a scam that these vendors are selling you. So don't trust at all because like the premise is that people look where the mouse cursor is. So it's kind of like cheap uh, poor man's eye tracking, but it's, it's BS, it, it's not. Like imagine, think about the last time you read an article uh, on a website. So with your mouse cursor, where you're doing like this, like reading line by line, didn't think so. So we, we are basically just scrolling down and we're reading with our eyes. So this is completely useless, don't do it. And finally, good, good useful, useful feature they have is session replays. So anything that users are doing on your website is filmed or like recorded as, as, a, as a clip, a video clip that you can play back without audio. So you don't know what they're trying to accomplish. You, you have no idea about their, their intent uh, or what are they experiencing, but you can see what they're doing. So usually if in digital analytics, I see a page where a lot of people are dropping off. They're like leaving the site. I want to watch videos of what are people doing or not doing on that page. And often you find something really, really interesting. So I had this case where uh, it was a five-step funnel. Uh, they had to fill out an online resume. And in step three, massive drop-off. After they had filled out two long forms on page one and two, it's like they already invested a lot of time in this. Why are they stepping, uh, like leaving the site in step three? So I watched session replays, and what I found was that there was a question in the four, in page on page three that asked, you have to name three references, and it was mandatory. People didn't have them, so they left the site. And thanks to video session replays, I understand where, like what specific question was the problem, took it out, conversions went up. Why aren't more people buying your stuff? And when they see your offer, what are they thinking? Next step in our research process is qualitative research. So when quantitative research can answer questions like where, what, and how much, qualitative research answers the question, why? Why users behave this way or that way? Why did they do this or that and why or why didn't they? It's not perfect. We can't answer everything with 100% accuracy. But to me, this is the most insightful part of any uh, research process uh, because we're talking to our actual users. This is so, so, so important. Now, there are multiple ways how to do quality research and we'll go uh, over this real quick. Number one is customer surveys. So you want to survey people who just bought something from you or they signed up for whatever something, your software for a free trial. So now you want to survey them. You want to send them out the survey within like 24 hours, 48 hours of them uh, purchasing something while they still freshly remember their purchasing experience. Because if you survey them 12 months later, they don't remember the details of your website or what, what went on. They're going to bullshit to lead you astray. So you want to survey them fresh. You want to, you can use any survey, to, uh, you know, software, whether it's Typeform, Google Forms, completely free. It really doesn't matter. You send them, you send the survey over email, and you want to ask open-ended 
questions. No multiple choice. You know, you can use multiple choice for segmentation, like if that matters, like male, female, your age range, something like this, whatever is relevant to your business, or maybe none. You don't want to ask multiple choice because that will assume that you already know what the possible answers are. So, and so what, what, do you, what do you want to ask? So one is you want to ask about the friction in their purchasing process. You want to ask, what was the one thing that nearly stopped you from buying from us? You also want to ask about their motivation, like what kind of a problem were you looking to solve for yourself? Of course, if they bought a pair of pants, might have been lack of pants, so you don't need to ask that. But if, if they're uh, shopping for a SaaS tool, it's different, right? There's a, there's a problem and there's a, uh, there's a solution, there's a use case, and you want to understand their motivation, their user, user intent. Uh, you also want to understand how your offer compared to other offers. So how many other websites did you check out before deciding to buy from us? What made you buy from us and not these other guys? To understand what in their mind was the competitive advantage. And also, you know, I've, I've done this type of service for years. I've never seen a case where people said, oh, I never checked out the competition, just bought from you. They always do their research. They always do competitive intelligence check out multiple sites uh, and it's very important for you for you to know how many different sites on average they're checking out and what are those other sites so you can have a value proposition that stands out because nothing in, is worse than sameness so customer service very important another thing is on-site polls so basically this is serving people on your website who might or might not buy anything these polls you want to trigger when they're visiting one of your high exit pages, so pages where people are dropping off and close to the money. So like checkout page, cart page, one of those pages. And so you want to trigger a, a poll, a question when they're leaving the page or when they've uh, demonstrated above average engagement, meaning like uh, they're like they've spent on the page 20 seconds or something like this. And so what you want to do is you want to ask only one question and also open ended. Uh, like, and usually I like to ask, what's holding you back from doing whatever you, we want people to do on this page? So on a checkout page, what's holding you back from completing this purchase right now? Or on a product page, you know, what's holding you back from getting this product right now? And people will tell you, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Uh, you can sometimes get uh, a higher uh, response rate if you if you start with a yes no question because as like is there something holding you back from making this purchase yes no because it it seems it's really easy to answer so they click yes there is and now then you uh, you ask them type in you know what is the reason so you can do that as well so for instance we had this case where on a cart page on an e-commerce site massive drop off people are not moving into the checkout and we're looking at the page and just you know coming up with all kinds of hypotheses, why that might be. And then we ran this poll and 90% of people said it's the high shipping costs. And just by looking at the cart page, it was impossible for us to figure out that the high shipping costs was the reason for people to abandon the page. But yeah, people told us, we asked them, they told us. And finally, the, you should interview actual customers, just talk to them one-on-one. -on -one and your, your moderation skills are everything. I also like to interview customer service reps. Ask them like, hey, when people are calling in, what are their top questions? You know, and because I might want to put that content onto the website. Like maybe people are calling, what kind of pre-purchase questions they get? Uh, and, and, or, or uh, you know, what kind of technical problems people are complaining about? Interviews, also interviews with salespeople. If it's like, call now to buy blah, 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 blah. I want to ask, what are the questions again, people considering a purchase, uh, what are they asking? And what type of answers work really well? Because the salespeople are picking up the phone call, they're, they're usually very experienced. Finally, if you have live chat on your website, and you should, it really works, read through the transcripts. Read through the transcripts of what they're asking, what are the common questions. And again, you want to pay attention to patterns, like some questions, I guarantee you, I ask more often than other questions. And if you go through these four steps, you'll have a pretty good idea of what your users want and how they want it. You can learn a lot by just observing users, just by looking at what they're doing on your website.
Last point in our conversion research process is user testing. User testing essentially means that we're going to recruit people that represent our target audience and we'll have them use our website. We'll have them perform certain tasks and we're going to just observe how they go about performing these tasks and whether they encounter any problems, usability issues, you know, any, any sorts of friction. Number one, and the easiest, fastest, cheapest way of conducting user testing is remote, unmoderated user testing. So this is when you use sites like trymyui.com, usertesting.com, and, and, and so on, where you just go and specify the number of people you want, more or less what their demographic should be like, and then you plug in your website URL and write down the tasks you want people to accomplish, and bam, done. It's really fast, really cheap. Out of these three options, it's the least valuable, but it's, it's so much cheaper and faster, you can do it. Now, ideally, the people performing tasks on your website are the people, uh, you know, represent your target audience, but anybody is better than nobody. So even your grandma, because your, your, your website should be, you know, usable for everybody. The specific lingo on the website might be, you know, like if you're selling marketing automation, your grandma is not maybe going to understand this, but so hence, you, if you want somebody to assess your copy and your value proposition, you need somebody else. Then rem remote moderated is basically you can use Skype or Zoom or any of these tools where the person that you're basically interviewing, moderating a, a, a user testing session. So they're sharing their screen and using your website and you're giving them prompts what they should do or what not do. This is only successful if you're a good moderator because a terrible moderator will will ruin this process it's it's so you, you don't want to do this the best way to do this is in person moderated so basically you go to a user's home office they come to you but like going to them is better when they're in their natural environment they feel you know comfortable relaxed all that stuff and again moderator skills are 90 percent of the outcome but this is this is the most time consuming and the most expensive so what kind of tasks should these people perform i like to give them roughly three types of tasks do something highly specific. So if it's e-commerce, find a pair of pants, size 34, black, uh, under $30. You know, very specific, and I want to see how they go about finding that. Because some people have very specific ideas what they want, and you want to test your site, can they find that specific thing? And then you want to give them a broad task. Hey, it's your uh, you know, best friend's birthday coming up, find something they will like. And so, again, you, you don't say you search or use the menu, you just want to see how they go about it. No specific instructions. And finally, you, you want to have them complete the funnel. So, like, complete the checkout, buy the product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you want to recruit 5 to 15 people. So, uh, less than 5, it's hard to, hard to tell uh, which uh, user was an outlier and, like, just weird. Uh, and, and more than 15 people is unnecessary because... The same issues keep up, keep coming up, and you you don't get really any new insights. So the ROI uh, goes down beyond 15. So you hire, uh, recruit five to 15 people through. If you use unmoderated, then usertesting.com, try my UI will give you a panel to recruit from. If you do, re, um, if you do moderated, you want to recruit people through different channels. You know, Craigslist uh, might work, or generally there's a Facebook group for any interest you know if it's beekeeping there's a beekeeping group if there are uh, runners in oklahoma there's a there's there are probably 100 facebook groups for those people and and so so find those facebook groups and you can say hey join that group and say hey i'm looking for for a beekeeper to uh, you know give me feedback on a uh, on, on on my website and obviously it needs to be paid uh, depending on how much time you want from them be, these people might be paid 25 to 100 bucks. Uh, it might not be cash, might be, you know, gift cards, Amazon, Walmart gift cards, whatever. And it's important that you just pay attention to what they do, not what they say. Because I've had plenty of experiences where people go through the website, they have a horrible experience, mainly on mobile, because mobile experiences still suck on so many websites. And, and uh, like they really struggle checking out, like they just can't figure out how things work. And then you ask them, so how was this? How was your experience? Oh, it was great. Uh, what did you like about the site? Oh, it was so easy to use. Uh, what would you change about the website? Oh, nothing at all. And I saw that person struggle for seven minutes. So, you know, don't don't really listen to what they're saying. Just pay attention to what they do, 
figure out what the problems are, fix them, and do a new round of user testing to see if those problems persist or the, the fixes that you implemented maybe they solve the issues. But you'll discover new ones. What works the best? Does this work better or this one? By how much? A-B testing is how you find out. So once we've completed our conversion research process, we have a list of problems uh, that we are aware of. Now you gather a team of uh, people from various teams, you know, de designer, developer, business expert, you know, whoever, and together you hypothesize what should be changed to tackle this problem that we have identified. And you want to come up with as many different ideas as possible for treatments. Some people advocate that, you know, like the ideas that you come up with should be all very similar. But it, there's also something to the, to the idea that all ideas are fungible, meaning that there is no, no idea is better than the other idea. These are just ideas. So you just need more ideas. And then the more radically different the ideas are, the better. Because if, if everybody is like, oh, yeah, you know, that's the way to solve it, you're going to be wrong. Because there, there oftentimes the, the idea for a treatment that nobody believes in ends up being, uh, being the winner. So you want to come up with as many ideas as possible. And now you want to, based on your traffic, you have to decide how many variations can you test at once. Because A-B testing is really A-B-N testing. It could be A-B-C-D uh, testing. And, and A-B testing and the statistics around it is actually it's pretty complicated. And the rabbit hole goes really, really deep. So in here, I'm going to just cover you this, uh, cover the essentials that you need to know but there's so much more to explore for you down the line. So once you figure out what are the treatments you want to test, uh, you, you, you can do some uh, calculations about around how many treatments can you test at once. Because there's a very important test. If we run an AB test or ABC test, when is it done? When is the test over and we can say this worked or didn't work? So it's, it's about stopping rules. Basically, you need to take into consideration three things. And one is sample size. Do we have enough people in the experiment to have statistical validity? Because we need a certain sample size, a certain population to be part of the experiment to be able to detect a difference between variations. Because you know we're going to compare which of these variations is going to increase sales the most. And the smaller the difference, so let's say B is 2% better than A, we need way more people to detect the 2% difference versus let's say variation C is like 25% better than A, our control, then we need much less sample size to be able to detect that, um, uh, that uplift, uh, whether the test is, is, uh, is a valid, uh, has a valid winner or not. For calculating how much sample size, how many people you need per variation, there are all kinds of sample size calculators out there. So just Google A-B test sample size calculator. You'll find one. It's, it, there's there's no, not much to it. It's pretty easy. So this is number one criteria. So the sample size calculators will tell you how many people you need. And then you can look at your own traffic and determine like how much time do I need to get that amount of people to be part of my experiment. If you have a, if you're in you know, google.com, you know, it's, it takes, it takes a day, right? It takes 30 minutes to get, you know, all, all those people. So let's say that we need, you know, 100,000 people per variation. Our, uh, our sample size calculator shows us. Uh, if your website has 100,000 people per month, then you can't run that A-B test. Statistics is, is, it's math and you can't change math. So low small low traffic websites just don't have enough volume to run a b test if you have less than 500 transactions so it's like purchases per month or signups then you can't do a b testing you don't have enough volume if you have 500 to a thousand per month you can maybe run one test per month but like to implement the proper testing program you need more than a thousand transactions now the transaction could also be an email sign up uh, then, of course, you can only optimize for email signups, not purchases. So, but let's say that we are, you know, 
google.com and getting uh, 100,000 visitors per variation takes us, you know, 30 minutes uh, to a certain page. Is the test done in 30 minutes? No, because what we're doing is we're taking then a convenient sample of our, of, of our traffic, not a representative sample, because we need people behave differently in the morning and afternoon. Uh, Monday behavior is different from Friday behavior and weekend behavior is completely different. And also, let's say we run a test from uh, a full week, you know, so from Monday to Sunday, and that might be fine, but how do we know that this week is not weird, that this week is not an outlier? Maybe this week our competition did something that impacted our test. So it's better to always test at least for two business cycles. For most companies, it's going to be two weeks. Uh, and of course, if, if you can't reach your desired sample size in two weeks, you need to test longer. When it comes to building A-B tests, you know, somebody needs to design them, somebody needs to you know, code them up. So depending on the changes you need to uh, build those treatments that are addressing the problems that you identified in the research process, the test can be simple or complicated. So most testing tools have a visual editor, but the visual ed editor is extremely limited meaning that you can just tweak, copy, and maybe change a button color, but you should really not use the visual editor. Because in visual editor, you know, as I said, you are highly, highly limited in what you can do. And your hypothesis sh uh, should not come from what can I do with the visual editor, but they should come from what is the best treatment to fix this problem that I identified here. So in most, for most 99% of A-B tests, you need a front-end developer to build this test for you inside a testing tool or in, in whatever code editor. It essentially, it's manipulating the front-end code. So you need to know, uh, you know CSS, jQuery, JavaScript, etc. So if you're not a developer, don't add them to be one. Hire a developer. There are comp dedicated companies that build A-B tests for you, like code them up, uh, design them, whatever you need. So no worries here. Now, number one test result killer is uh, a broken code. So meaning that you, you create an A-B test, you run it, your variation B is losing heavily, like minus 50%. Like, oh, our idea was you know, bad. But in fact, very often and most often, the reason is that it just doesn't work. The variation B actually doesn't work in, in most, if not all browsers. There's a bug in there. Something is off. Uh, so quality assurance testing for A-B test is extremely, extremely critical. You cannot miss this step. Most um, testing teams all have a dedicated QA people, QA teams, QA full-time QA people who, who, who conduct quality assurance on their tests. You need it to run A-B tests uh, to make sure that there are no bugs in there. So once your test is done, now there are three choices what may happen. Nothing at all, meaning it's flat. There's no significant difference between the two. Well, then, you know, there's something else. Uh, there's, you know, that your treatment lost. Okay, there's something else. Or your, your treatment uh, was a winner. Implement the winner. Now, in case it was flat or in case it was a loser, it's still, it's still learning. Now, you might go and look at your... Uh, analyze the test results per segment. So you want to look how the, the people in your test uh, responded to the treatment. If you look new versus returning or different traffic source or, and of course you, you should always test mobile and desktop separately. If you combine them, you want to look at them separately, but the same rules apply here. In order for, an, uh, for you to analyze results within a segment, you need enough sample size inside a segment as well. So if you have a low traffic website, you can't really do any segmentation here. But if you also discover things that don't work, that's progress. You want to understand what works and what doesn't work. So learning, there are no losses. It's, it's just only, only learning. But yeah, A-B test helps you figure out what really works and put an end to opinions and arguing over what, what is better. Just test it.